thoughts can become our worst enemies during the times of transformation. This episode equips you with tools to conquer negative thoughts and maintain a positive mindset amidst change. Hello everyone. How are you all? Hope you're all keeping well. We meet again and we are on this journey together discussing the strategies to survive a time of transition. I'm Father Bonnie Abraham and thank you for tuning in and listening and reflecting together. As you can see, I am standing in front of a fence, somebody's property, and it's been fenced around. And the particular type of transition we go through, that we fence around ourselves, like the first strategy I said, building an ark. We create a deliberate fence, so a lot of distractions cannot come in. And we don't go searching for distractions, but rather, we stay remained very committed to the time of change. And as we discussed in the previous episodes, this change is not because we are misjudged or mistaken. So we go through suffering because of our sins. We go through this time of transition. We have brought this upon ourselves. Well, a lot of the time when we look at uh, books and people, a lot of people glorify righteous suffering. He hasn't committed that, but he went through that. But what about people like me? Like, yes, I made a mistake. Do I have a second chance? Can I climb back to the mountain from which I came back? Can I rebuild my life? Is there hope? And we look at the gospel. And according to the gospel, there is hope. There is hope that passion and death will not be the end, but there is always resurrection. And we discussed a few strategies to build an ark, being vulnerable, being our own best friends, uh, having healthy distraction and not to self-medicate. That was in the previous episode we discussed. We belong to change. We accepted the fact that we are going through this time of darkness and valley and everything in the valley, valley is belong to us. And we are, we are slowly becoming things we have identified. Yes, number one, number two, number three, these things have to change in my life. So I am putting my effort and it is, it is a time that I have isolated myself. Yes, there is going to be time of loneliness. There is going to be isolation. There are times I will be angry and upset. I'm staying close to the reality through my journaling, through my poems. I have a healthy set of friends who keeps me company. And then there are people who from the, my first mountain coming, looking and searching for me because they really love me for who I was and who I am. All these things happening. But you know, our biggest enemy in this particular time of transition and change is our thoughts. It's our thoughts. It's like we are, we have fenced ourselves. Nobody can come in deliberately. We are not going out very deliberately because we know that this is a time of change. And when we are like that, our biggest enemy is our thoughts. How do we deal with our thoughts? And most of the time, these thoughts are shameful thoughts, fearful thoughts, angry thoughts. And sometimes these thoughts can self-sabotage us. These thoughts can really self-sabotage us. Put ourselves, every work we are trying to do, our psychology is helping, therapist is helping, spiritual director is helping, our close friends are staying, helping us to focus on our journey. But our thoughts, at times, fail us. Now, when I was going through my time of change, my biggest challenge was attending my thoughts. 
to really dealing with my thoughts. I didn't have many distractions. I cut them off. I didn't look for them. They didn't look for me. Only the people I allowed came in. But my thoughts, they were always there. They were always there. One of the strategy that helped me to deal and attend to my thoughts was something called CBT. Not cognitive behavioral therapy that we see in psychology or counseling, but cognitive biblical therapy. One of the biggest blessings in my life is this, my Bible. My grandfather gave to me when I was 15. Um, it's an English Bible, so it has been with me for how many years? Almost 25 years. This was my biggest blessing during the time of Valley. What is CBT? I said it's cognitive biblical therapy. So let's a uh, bit more closely look into CBT. Cognitive biblical therapy. And it has really helped me, especially to deal with my thoughts when I was going through my time of change. As I said, when we go through this valley of a particular existence, our thoughts are our biggest enemy. Actually, there's a, something really touched me about these thoughts. For those who live in the city, they don't have many distractions because they are in the midst of distractions. They can't see their thoughts because they are so busy. But those who live in the solitude, especially like me when I was going through my change, or if you are going through a change and you have created a deliberate existence without a lot of distractions, then they are in that place where there is that we fenced around ourselves, nobody is coming in, there's no distraction. Our thoughts become very amplified. Our thoughts become very amplified and we have to see and know our thoughts and hear our thoughts more than those people who live in the cities or with so many disturbances, so many voices around them so they don't have to always attend to their thoughts. And one of the patristic fathers, Ivalgus Ponticus, I came across this quote from him. He said, if you want to be a holy monk leading a monastic life, you have to attend to your thoughts. You have to know the origin of your thoughts. You have to know the intensity of their thoughts. You have to know when they come and when they go. You have to know their arrival and their departure. And you have to know their intensity. And you have to know their rhythm. You have to know their occurrences and you have to know their triggers, how they are triggered. So how that particular quote really helped me that I begin to attend to my thoughts. I started to look at closely my thoughts. What are they? How often they come? And when they come, what happens to my body? And when do they come? What triggers these particular thoughts? And what are their intensity? When those thoughts come, how much they linger? Oh, what is the intensity of their bite? So once I come to really attend to my thoughts, I'm able to find a control over them. It's like a sh shameful thought comes and then I kind of, my body is giving into it. I kind of scoop down and my eyes are down, my head is down because, not because somebody, somebody doing something to me, because I don't see many people, because I'm in a particular existence in my valley. But my own thoughts is becoming so real. The voice of shame is becoming so real. My head is going down. My eyes are closing down. I'm kind of really sort of lacking energy because of the thoughts. And that is the effect on my body. And if it is the thought on anger, I'm thinking, I'm going through this time of change and transformation and I'm thinking about somebody who actually caused me shame and I'm so getting angry. I could feel it in my body. 
and I could go from the reality to some sort of angry existence. So it affects my body. So that's why the patristic father said, when we are with ourselves, with our thoughts, they become enemy. To win over them, we have to know them really well. We have to do a post-mortem on their thoughts. We have to literally analyze the thoughts when they come and how often they come, if they come, how long they stay, and if they leave, when do they leave, and what triggers them to come at all. And once we know that, we can catch that thoughts and surrender them to Christ, says the patristic father. And for me, one of my biggest blessings, whenever I had shameful thought, fearful thought, angry thought, anxious thought attacking me, is to do a cognitive biblical therapy. It's from the letter of uh, St. Paul, second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. There is a beautiful word. It is this, we keep every thought captive to Christ. What does St. Paul say? We keep every thought captive to Christ. I think it was when in my high school years, in the late 90s, I was sent by my parents, especially my mother, influenced by a parishioner to a retreat. Um, it was a retreat for the young people. And there I experienced something very religious. Uh, we call it the experience of Holy Spirit, but I call it baptism in the Holy Spirit. So I went to this retreat, not expecting anything. Uh, the only reason I went to the retreat is because of my friends. I had so much fun in the first and second day, but on the third day, they were talking about the Holy Spirit. And I opened my hands and as they're singing, I started to sing along with them. And then, something started happening to me. Even today, I don't know exactly, but I felt a deep love in me. I felt overwhelmed by something that is coming into me. It's like there is someone else also with me. And later I realized it must be the Holy Spirit living in me and I'm experiencing a new baptism. It's like I'm being immersed in something or something is being immersed into me and, and spreading all over me. It's a sense of the Holy Spirit living, living in me. And since then, I had a desire to read and study the Word of God. So this is when I was 15. I remember studying the Word of God by heart, not knowing its power, but it was like what we did after that retreat. We had a group of friends. I study one Word of God. He studied another Word of God. She studied another Word of God. And then I wanted to show off. I studied five or six or ten. But guess what? When I was going through this time of change and pain, those Word of God that I by hearted, it was an automatic mechanical effort to by heart them not knowing the real meaning of it. But when I was going through a challenge, a difficult time, those word of God became my everything, became my everything. Like the times I felt shame, I, I was able to read the Bible in from Joshua. I will be with you, take courage. Chapter one, verse five. Be strong and courageous, I will be with you. Now how much that comforted me when I was going through the valley. And Psalm 23, even if you walk through the darkest valley, I will be with you. Psalm 139, even if you hide in, in the depth of the sea, even if you fly away to the skies, if you make your life hell, like it, it says if you go to the hell, but I believe if I choose, I don't want God, I am going reckless, I go deliberately make my life hell. What the word of God says, God is there. He sees me. He sees me when I rise up. He sees me during noontime. He sees me when I'm in the evening. He sees me always. And the Psalm 139 finishes with this prayer. Search me, God, and know my heart. See if there is any wickedness in me. And if there is, please lead me on right path. And this was my prayer 
during the valley. I just was honest to God. I said to God, yes, I have made mistakes and I'm going through a time of crisis and change. I want to change. I accept my faults. Can I have a second chance? Search me, God. You know I am. I have a good heart. You know that. Search me, God. and know my path. And if there is any wickedness in me because of my upbringing, because of the culture I live in, or because of my own faults, if there is any wickedness in me, show me that and lead me into right path and where would I get this prayer if I hadn't by hearted this when I was very young I was so blessed because of the gift of the Word of God the cognitive biblical therapy I I kept captive all the shameful thought all the angry thought all the anxious thought captive to the thought of Christ which is the Word of God Word of God always bring hope it brings life within us. In the time of valley, as I started the valley, not just in the time of valley, as I started the valley, and valley means change as we know, I relied on word of God. I had nowhere else to go. And I am proud of it. I'm proud of this Bible who has been with me for the last 25 years. I opened the Bible and I received a word and I kept that word all throughout my time of change, my time of transformation. Let me read that to you. It's from Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah chapter 49 is known to all of us. It's a famous passage 49.15 actually. What is it? Can a woman forget her child? No, she can't. But even if she forgets you, I will not forget you. And I knew this word of God by heart. So I was reading it. I was reading it with, oh, I know this word of God. You know, it is not going to terribly help me now. But by the grace of God, I looked beneath it. And I have never noticed that word of God. I normally get stuck, oh, can a woman forget her nursing child, show no compassion or show no compassion for the child of her womb. Even if she forgets, I will not forget. And normally it kind of consoles me. But that particular time, as I was going through all these thoughts, something else I looked at. And it was verse 17. It says like this, your builders outdo your destroyers. Your builders will outdo your destroyers. And those who laid you waste will go away from you. Lift up your eyes. You will put all your enemies as an ornament around you. This is, this is the power of the word of God. You imagine I am going through 100% shame when I read, I got 200% hope. Your builders will outdo your destroyers. My weaknesses, my issues in my life destroyed me. Now God is doing something because I embraced the cross. And what is he saying to me through the word of God? Bonnie, your builders, those who are trying to build you again, will outdo they will do a better job than your destroyers. And everything that you are ashamed of now, your weaknesses, your drawbacks, is going to become an ornament around you. It reminds me of Jesus. When he comes to the disciples after his resurrection, he shows them, hey, Thomas, come here. See the wounds, put your hands in them. In other words, the wounds of tragedy, the wounds of pain, the wounds of fear, the wounds of rejection upon the cross, all those things become a glorious sign of salvation and resurrection. 
In that way, when I was going through the valley, the word of God told me, Bonnie, all the weakness that you think you have now, all the brokenness you carry now, everything that you are ashamed of, your upbringing and your childhood, or everything that happened in your past, which brought you to the valley, one day you will wear them as ornaments. God will transform me upon this burning bramble tree, upon this thorny tree, God's love will be a fire that you cannot take your eyes away from it. And all this hope came to me because of the word of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who can separate us from the love of God? Sin, persecution, sword, not even death can separate us from the love of God. My dear brothers and sisters, if you are going through a time of change, a time of valley, and you created an ark, you are becoming your own best friend, you're trying your best staying close to the reality, you're trying to have healthy distraction instead of self-medication, you're trying to be vulnerable, but at times your thoughts are attacking you and putting you down. I encourage you, what helped me was the Word of God, catching every thought captive to Christ. If you have a Bible, go to it. The Bible will comfort you. It will give you hope. It will increase our faith. It will increase our love because God lives in us and this Word will become flesh in us. I pray with you, may the Holy Spirit speaking through the Word of God bring you hope, bring you love, and increase your faith. God bless you, and I will see you in our next episode, discussing once again some strategies to survive the time of change. Maybe getting you can't always. This is the death. Remarkably Turn back towards God. Rise up.